Our next speaker is Brother Eddie Braddy. Eddie preaches for the Whitful Church of Christ in Whitful, Virginia. Is that right? Virginia. He is a graduate of the Tri-City School of Preaching in 2014. 13. 13. And he's married to his wife, Renetta. They have two children. Grant is his son that just led the singing. And his topic will be walk by faith and not by sight. Brother Eddie, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's a little bit better. I saw several people leaving after the one o'clock hour, and I didn't really take it personal. I just kind of figured they've heard me preach before, and they could hear me from the interstate. So, uh, if you've ever heard me before, but it's an honor to be here. Appreciate Grant leading song. I I don't lead songs, so I bring one with me, a song leader with me. But I appreciate him. He he has done a wonderful job. He's actually before. Uh, Last year, uh, in December, we had several deaths in the congregation, and some of our song leaders um, couldn't be there, and we did a cappella singing the funeral. And I said, Grant, can you do it? He said, I got your back, Dad. And he led some songs and some funerals. So he does a great job, and we appreciate, appreciate him. It's an honor to be in here today. Um, I'm always grateful to the school to come back. And when I came to the school, I came for several reasons, but two main reasons. The first one was to get biblical knowledge come here and get knowledge of the Bible and the second was to have the opportunity to be a full-time gospel preacher I wanted to be a full-time gospel preacher that's what I wanted to dedicate my life to I came here and I got the knowledge and by the grace of God at the end of my first year of school I was offered a job and I'm still there so um, both of those things happened because I came to this school and I appreciate the elders of the congregation here and all the instructors and I told Robert I agree with everything he said, except no, no, I did not like Greek at all. But I'm very fortunate that I had Greek, because it's really helped me along the way. Today my topic is, we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But I want to start out with a story here, and a story of a school teacher who was assigned to visit children in a large city hospital, who received a routine call requesting that she visit a particular child. The teacher took the boy's name and number and was told by the teacher on the other end of the phone that we're studying nouns and adverbs in this class, so I'd be grateful if you could help him with his homework so he doesn't fall behind the others. It wasn't until the visiting teacher got outside the boy's room that she realized it was located in the hospital's burn unit. Now at that moment, as we continue to story them over, that moment it goes... You can kind of see where it goes with the lesson. She's got a decision now. She understands there's a child there. She understands that what well, she's about to walk into and put her eyes upon. So is she going to be committed and continue that commitment she's made and has, have the faith that she's going to be blessed? Or is she going to turn around because of what she might see? Well, she realized she could not turn around. So she stammered awkwardly. I'm the hospital teacher, and your teacher sent me to help you with nouns and adverbs. The boy was in so much pain that he barely responded. The young teacher stumbled through his English lesson, ashamed at putting this kid through what she considered was a senseless exercise. The next morning, a nurse on the burn unit asked her, What did you do to this boy? Before the teacher could finish her outburst of apologies, the nurse interrupted her, No, you don't understand. We've been wor very worried about this young child. But ever since you were here yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment as if he has decided to live. The boy later explained that he had completely given up hope. He says, I have completely given up hope until he saw that teacher walk through that door. It all changed when he came to a simple realization of this. With joyful tears, the boy said, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a boy who was dying like me, would they? You see, because of her commitment, because of her faith, and what she believed in, it was teaching. She could make a difference. She walked through that, and she didn't allow what she knew she was going to physically see to stop her from accomplishing what she knew was the right thing to do. What does it mean to walk by faith and not by sight? 
2 Corinthians 5, 7. This statement is found in Paul's context of talking about Christian's future, a Christian's future after death. And what a wonderful future that will be if we accomplish that, that verse of walking by faith and not by sight. Being assured of that now, we can have the assurance to walk securely through the problems and difficulties of life. But let's look at the definitions of these terms. First of all, we. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that word we is defined as God's people. God's faithful people. Christians, the church. The word walk is defined to pursue a course of action of a way of life. How one moves along doing his course, his or her course of life. Faith, believing and trusting in God. Following His way and will daily. Obedience to the Word of God. Now that's wean, that's walk, and that's faith. That's how I define those here. But I also want to define that last word there, sight. Because that's also part of this verse, and you define that as trusting in self and what can be received, perceived with human senses. Walking by faith involves a change. A change in self. 2 Corinthians 5.17 It's already been presented this week, but therefore if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creature, new creation. All things have passed away. And look, new things. We call this three things. This new person is three things. It's conversion. It takes a conversion to become new. You become a Christian after that. And then you become a Christian after obeying the gospel. You obey the gospel. You become a child of God. and you're, It's conversion. Christians are, buried, are, are brand new people on the inside, and the inside controls the outside. At the time of conversion, one does not merely turn over a new leaf. No, he simply does this. He begins a new life under a new master. We're always going to be under some type of master. We can say we are, we can say we're not, but we will be. If we're of the world, then that's our master. But when we become a child of God, our master is God now. We forfeit an old destiny, which is hell. And we gain a new destiny, which is heaven. Three basic changes must occur in spiritual conversion. A scriptural conversion. The heart, which is affection, must be changed from the love of sin to the love of God. And secondly, the life, which is conduct. A person must be changed from sin now to righteousness. And the state, which is the relationship of a man must be changed from the realm of Satan's rule to the realm of God's kingdom. Walking by faith involves knowing, believing, obeying the right things. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in its end is the way of death. The path that seems right offers many options. The path that, right, that seems right may offer many options and require a few sacrifices. Easy choices should make us take a second look. I've learned that. Something that's easy, you get a call. Have you ever got a call that you've won a vacation? You give your credit card? If you've given your credit card, please see me after this. Okay, I've got a lot to sell you. The right choice often requires hard work and self-sacrifice, which is where the faith starts to come in. Don't be enticed by apparent shortcuts that seem right and popular, but are not to be found in the pages of God's holy word. Not written of men, not the writings of men, but the Bible, the mind of God in print. Many human creeds, one Bible. We need to obey the right doctrine. Look at Matthew 15, 9. Matthew 15, 9, And in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. 1 Timothy 4, 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to the deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. Because you, when following God, it takes every bit of ounce of faith that you can, you can have. And sometimes people present things to you, they just look good. They look and that's easy. Well, why am I been doing this all my life? Why am I sacrificing this much when they're telling me this? 2 John 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. To walk by faith is to abide in the doctrine of Christ. And you see here, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, friends, it's simple. You don't have God. 
1 Timothy 4, 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22 there. We're going to see where faith comes into play here and what happens as long as Peter was focused. In order to remain in the faith and to walk by, by faith and not by sight, we have to block out the outside world. And I say this also a lot of times on Sunday morning, and I got to thinking about this coming over here this morning. A lot of times on Sunday I'll say, you know, as you come in here, leave all your burdens and your cares on the outside. Leave them on the outside. And that's so true. But I'm wrong in a sense there. It's not just on Sunday morning or Sunday night. The walk by faith, we've got to leave those on the outside, period. Outside of, of our faith. It's not just, you know, when I, say, when I say that, I was thinking, you know, I'm limited to just Sunday morning. Don't worry about these things. Friends, to walk by faith is you got to not worry about those outside distractions every single day of your life. Matthew 14, 22-33, familiar scripture to you, but immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now watch this, and when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when the evening came, he was alone there. That's first of all I think about that is to stay in the faith. I want to be like Jesus. He went up on the mountain he went up alone. He went up there to pray. But the boat was now in the midst of the sea, tossed by the waves and the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, in verse 25, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Just imagine our Lord and our Savior. Just think about that picture for a moment. Walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw He was walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on water. So he said in verse 29, Come. And when Peter walked, Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Think about this text for a moment. So as long as Peter was focused on Jesus, he was successfully walking on the waters of the Sea of Galilee. And I want you to think about this. He actually could physically see Jesus. He could see Him. But when he began to lose focus, there is Christ right there. And yet the winds and the waves calls Him to lose focus. This is the world. If we don't walk by faith, if we start to walk by sight, it is so easy to be distracted. It is so easy for one little wind or one little wave to take us and drain us and destroy us. Here he is, he sees this Christ and he says, now he starts to lose focus. He begins to seek. That's the same thing with us. We can't for a moment take our eyes off of Christ. You say, well, Brother Bradley, that's difficult. It's almost impossible. The more we walk in the faith and the more we surround ourselves with children of God and the more we surround ourselves with with that time, Philippians 4, 8, meditate on the things which are good, are pure, are noble. My friends, we're going to walk in the faith more. Not saying we're going to be perfect, but praise God, we can be complete. You see, but when he began to focus on the wind the waves, he sank. He began to sink. But what happened? He changed his focus. There was no longer walking by faith now. He was looking at the winds. He was looking at the waves. And now he was walking by sight. He was afraid of what could happen. His faith wavered and then he realized what he was doing. We will not be walking on water, but we will walk through situations in our Christian life here. Situations. As I was telling somebody earlier today, Brother Milton does a phenomenal job with preaching his work. But I've been at Whitfield six years. You can't prepare for some things that you're going to face. 
I have faced some things before in the ministry that I never thought I would face. In my Christian walk that I never thought I would. For me to be able to stay strong and for you, you have to walk by faith. If we focus on the wind and the waves and things of, that are difficult around us and we take our eyes off whom we serve, we will begin to sink. Hebrews 13.5 says, For he himself says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In order to maintain your faith when situations are difficult, focus on the power of God other than our own inadequacies. The power of God. Although we start out with good intentions, sometimes our faith falters. This doesn't mean we fail. When Peter's faith faltered, watch what he did. It faltered. He allowed things that he saw to get in his way. But what did he do? He reached out. And he said, Lord, save me. Immediately, I love the response. He knew the intentions of his heart. He knew what had happened. But he knew he, 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 reached, he knew where to go. And Jesus reached out immediately and saved him. He could have reached out to the boat. But it was too late to help. Sometimes we look at those physical things. We're in the wind and the waves and we look at what we can get like a boat. Maybe well, that will get us to shore. Well, maybe a material thing or something financially that will get us there. He could have reached out to the eleven that were with him, but they couldn't have helped. Not help. Although he was afraid, he still looked unto Christ. And Christ reached out to help him overcome his situation. We cannot limit the power of God. How wonderful it is to know in our faults and our failures... And as frail as we are, and when we let Christ down so many times, and yet we have that sincere heart of repentance, and we come to Him, that hand is always there. When you grow apprehensive about the troubles around you, and begin to doubt your ability to see it through, reach out to the Father. I want to talk about some do nots here. Do not take your eyes off God. There's not another. Do not take your eyes off the Bible. It is the only book that God has given. Do not take your eyes off the Gospel. It is God's power to salvation, Romans 1.16. Do not take your eyes off the church. All the saved are in it. Do not take your eyes off worship. Our God must be worshipped, John 4.24, in spirit and in truth. Do not take your eyes off of faithfulness. The devil will lead you astray. In James, it talks about he walks around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And we can't underestimate that word there, seeking. The devil is active. He is seeking who he may devour. We need God more today than we ever have. Do not take your eyes off the truth. It can only make you free. It, it, it can deliver you. Do not take your eyes off of heaven. It is the finish line for the race we're running. Do not lose focus, John 14, 6. For He is the way and the life. The winds and the waves of a religious divided world that will distract us and confuse us. The wind and waves of man-made churches will distract us and confuse us. The wind and waves of human creeds and man-made re written religions, doctrines, will distract and confuse us. The wind and waves of self-proclaimed religious leaders will distract and confuse us. The wind and waves of Satan efforts to claim your soul, to reclaim your soul, will distract and confuse us. The winds and waves of large numbers of believing and teach certain things will distract us and confuse us. The winds and waves of discouragement and disappointments will distract us and confuse us. Keep your eyes on faith, folks. On faith, focus on your Heavenly Father. There's a congregation where I preach at, not a Lord's church, it's a denomination. There's about 67, 68 churches in Worth County there. But there's a congregation that meets not far up the road. And we average right now, we're in the 50s, maybe we get the 60s some. Praise God, we've grown and God's been good to us. But there's a congregation up the road. On Sunday morning, they average 650. 650. And in that community, you talk to a lot of people, well, they've got games, they've got bouncy houses. They've got a cafe inside their building. How do you compete with that? You don't compete. 
you keep the faith. You pray for them. You keep the faith. You don't take what they're teaching and bring it to the Lord's church. That has happened too many times. It has creeped in because, oh, they've got 650. I'd rather worship with 60 than their minds are focused on God and we're praising God and we're doing the acts of worship according to the Bible than to worship with 650 people that are teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. Because that is not going to lead me to heaven. What's going to lead me to heaven is what's written in the pages of God's Word. Told you they could hear me on the interstate. What a joy, what a joy is to be created with the ability to be enthralled with our physical world. God intends that our physical nature draw, closer, draw us closer to Him, but you look at Romans 1.20. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, we often trust, to a great extent, what we see, taste, touch, smell, or hear. We're all guilty of that, aren't we? A lot of times. What we can see, and, and the thing is, we can't see God. But you know what? In a sense, we can. And don't tell you he's lost his mind, he can see God. If we're students of the Bible, that's the mind of God. We can't physically see Him, but we can see His will for us through His Word. We're wired that way that we often put great faith in what we experience through our, through our senses. The Bible illustrates how people since and come to know the truth, they live in the natural world. They believe based on first-hand experience. Go to John 20, 18-20. If you open your Bibles to John 20, 18 through 20, when the disciples were able to see Jesus' hands and inside after the resurrection, they could believe. Look at this. John 20, 18 through 20, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things to her. Then the same day of the evening began being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled to fear for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. You go to John 20, 26 and 27. John 20, 26 and 27. John 20, 26 and 27. And after eight days, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and says, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving and believing. I go back to John chapter 1, verse 35 there through 50. I teach a lesson on the power of the invitation when Jesus is talking to this Samaritan woman. And then what ends up happening because of that? She goes out saying, I've seen the Messiah. She physically saw. He offered the living water that would never cause her to thirst again. When the Egyptian and Israelites smelled the stinking Nile, they were, then they could believe. You go to Exodus 7 and 18. And the fish were in the river that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink, and the Egyptians will know to drink the water of the river. When the Romans heard the word of God, they were able to believe. Romans 10, 17. All people walk by faith. All people walk by faith when they trust history. And follow me here. While seeing is believing, we should not reason that only seeing is believing. We often trust in events and experiences we've not observed and validated firsthand. Consider George Washington. No one living today has seen him face to face, not even Wesley. Not even Wesley, face to face in the flesh. Yet we believe and pay with currency that validates his reality. We trust that he existed in the flesh, lived in our nation, and was our first president. None of this was actually experienced firsthand by anyone. But yet we have that dollar bill with his picture on it, and we believe that we can use that to purchase something. All people walk by faith when they conclude that George Washington existed based on what? Their trust of factual information that has come down to them historically. Of course, one may reflect.
even George Washington, even the face of a mountain of death, of definite convincing evidence in Jesus' day, some who saw what he did face to face still refused to believe. John 12, 37 says, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Friends, some are just not going to believe. I don't care what you do. We are to go, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and teach, teach the gospel to all nations. We understand that. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I also want you to also focus on your own life at times. We are to reach those souls that are lost. But don't get so weary in well-doing that we find ourselves walking by sight and not by faith. We must take care of our own person. We must wake up every morning with a grateful heart and pray and, and get our faith strong before we go out and do Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You can't be successful in teaching and preaching the gospel if you don't take care of yourself. It's like somebody been, maybe been married 10 times telling me how to be a good husband. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to listen. Unless they've had nine wives that die, okay? Every time a person acts on what they anticipate, they walk by faith and not by sight. When a person pulls up to a traffic light, finds that it's red, and they stop, now they act on what they anticipate. They trust that people will follow common, um, the common law set out by the civil law here. They trust that all people, when they see green, will trust that it's acceptable to proceed. Whether one believes in God or the Bible... Or not, as one approaches the traffic lights, he or she walks by faith, not by sight. Concerning walking by faith, Paul contrasts the visible realm with the invisible realm. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. In the visible world, we have a fleshly, earthly tent. A body that groans and a body that is mortal and away from the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. I'm not a long-winded preacher, so you're going to have some extra time to fellowship today. Having faith and confidence in the unseen is not so unreasonable. Religious believer and unbeliever alike constantly have faith and confidence in the unseen, either historically or futuristically. But look at 2 Corinthians 4.18. And the lesson's going to be yours in just a moment. 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then Hebrews 11.1. 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We have been, Renata and I was, talk, and I was talking about how blessed we were coming over here. We were able to stop somewhere and get something to drink, get a sandwich. And we, she was saying, there's so many people that woke up today that don't have that opportunity. The only way that we have been blessed and will continue to be blessed, it won't be without trials and it won't be without temptations. But if we continue to walk by faith, I know there's a God. Oh, I can't wait to see him. When I know that Revelation 21 4 says all tears will be wiped. There will be no tears in heaven. All all is wiped away. I cannot wait till that day. That's why I walk by faith. Life is hard. Life is difficult. It's a struggle. But there's nothing in this world worth going to hell over. Nothing. Thank you for your time.